so I could not make. Oops. And um, yeah, and I also apologize because I'm not able to to follow all the the very inter interesting and nice talks at this conference. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, entropic uh, regularization of optimal transport, but for multi-marginal problems. So basically, I will describe in a in, in an easy and self-contained way, uh, hopefully, two results. One, which is about the well posedness of the so-called Schrödinger system, so the system of optimality conditions for the dual in the multi-marginal setting. That's a joint work with Maxim Laborde. And the second result I will describe is a linear convergence uh, result for Syncorn in this uh, multi-marginal setting. Okay, so please interrupt me at any time if anything is unclear or if, uh, or if the sound is bad or anything. Okay, so I will start. Uh, uh, the first part will be kind of useless for most of you because you, you, you're all familiar with uh, optimal uh, transport, multi-marginal, maybe not, but uh, entropic transport. So uh, the first, the first um, part of my talk will be devoted to a description of the problem I'm going to be interested in. Then uh, I, I will uh, explain, give a proof of why this uh, multi-marginal Schrodinger system is well posed in the, in the standard sense of Adama, let's say, meaning uh, existence and uniqueness and smooth dependence with respect to the data of the problem. And then I will say a few words about why the multi-marginal synchron uh, converges linearly in a quite general setting provided the cost is bounded. Okay, so let's start with uh, Mosh Kotorovich, which you all know, so uh, just basically to set up some uh, notations. So you got a source measure uh, mu, a target measure nu, probably on different spaces, a cost function, C, and uh, you look for an optimal uh, plan, so a, a transport plan gamma between mu and nu, which minimizes the average uh, transportation cost, so the integral of CD gamma. Okay, uh, and of course, uh, a key, uh, and there are very good uh, textbooks uh, now about the problem, it's very uh, huge uh, effort since uh, at least 30 years to understand this problem. Uh, uh, I mentioned the books by uh, Villani and uh, more, a more recent one by, by Filippo Santambogio. And of course, a cornerstone of the theory, a useful tool is duality. So the contour of duality formula tells us that uh, the dual, this is linear programming, so the, it comes also in, in dual form as looking for potentials, phi and psi, which maximize the sum of the average of phi against the mu plus the average, of, uh, the average of psi against the mu, with a restriction that the direct sum of phi and psi is less than the transport cost. Okay, so uh, if given a, uh, given a phi, you look for the optimal psi, which is the largest one, you end up with the standard uh, C transform notion. So uh, given phi, the, the, the largest psi, which is admissible is a C transform of uh, phi. And as uh, Gabriel uh, mentioned, in fact, you cannot just take, if you, if you iterate C transforms uh, in the standard uh, optimal transport, when you do three times the, the, the C transform uh, to improve the cost, let's say, uh, you get back to the first C transform. So the CCC transform is the same as the C transform. So if you uh, do uh, alternate optimization on this dual formulation, it will not drive you uh, too far, right? But still, we know a lot about this duality because by complementary slackness, we know that optimal plans are concentrated where uh, on, on the set of pairs X and Y for which the, 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 the constraint is slack meaning that uh, phi of x plus phi c of uh, y should, should, should be equal to c of xy on the support of gamma. And uh, for instance, in the quadratic cost, this leads to Bonnier's theorem and to the fact that optimal gammas uh, should be supported, uh, should have a support which is included in the, in, in the graph of the subdifferential of a convex function, okay. which links the, this problem to mojo equation, for instance. Uh, now comes ent entropic regularization, so uh, you can view it as a as a trick or as an approximation, but it's it's in, in fact more involved than than this, where you add a strictly convex term with a small epsilon in front of it, in front of it, which is just the relative entropy of the cost with respect to a reference measure, which I will take to be the product of uh, the margins. Okay. 
So it's the same. You can, of course, absorb the, the, the transport codes in integral of C d gamma in the relative entropy. And this uh, regularization, this entropic regularization is the same as minimizing the relative entropy of gamma with respect to the measure, which has density uh, e to the minus c over epsilon, mu tensor nu, okay, among transport plants between mu and u. So pi of mu and u is a set of transport plants between mu and u. So again, this is a, this is a strictly convex uh, problem. And uh, at least formally, the structure of solution uh, is easy to understand. You can write Lagrange multipliers for the, for the, the marginal constraints. And at least formally, you can guess that the optimal plan gamma, gamma epsilon, depends on epsilon, should be of a product form times the Gibbs kernel e to the minus c over epsilon, mutants and u. But now the condition, and of course you can write this in, in exponential form. So if you define the kernel k as being uh, e to the minus c over epsilon, you change variables a and b, the Lagrange multipliers, you write them in, uh, in exponential form as well. Uh, now the solving this, uh, the, the, the optimal uh, entropic optimal transport amounts to find potential so that this, this plan has marginals mu and u, okay? So this becomes just a set of two equations. You can forget that it comes from optimization. You look for potentials A and B in such a way that these two, these two integral equations, so that one uh, is equal to a, a of x, the integral of k, b against d nu, and a similar equation between b and a. So it's a slightly nonlinear set of equations in terms of a and b. If you solve this set of equations, these two equations, then you have solved the, the entropy OT problem. So in exponential form, it's a, solving this problem is the same as saying that phi can be expressed as a function of psi by this formula. This is a sort of, uh, uh, this is what we saw in Gabriel's talk, and this is a sort of a soft C transform. Uh, so it's approximating uh, C transforms by uh, log Laplace, if you want. So phi should be a function of psi given by uh, the first formula, and, 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 and psi should, should solve a similar equation, okay? And these two equations, it's not very difficult to see that it's the Euler Lagrange system for the dual of uh, entropic OT problem, which amounts to find two potential, which minimize the same guy as we saw in the Kantorovich problem. So the integral of phi d mu plus the integral of psi d mu. But now you, you, you pay an exponential price by, uh, uh, on the, the constraints we had before, phi plus psi is less than the cost. You don't have this constraint, but you pay epsilon times the integral of this exponential against the reference measure, which is the product measure, okay? So just a remark, a very basic remark, is that uh, as in the uh, as in Kotorovich problem, you have an invariance, an obvious invariance in the problem. If you add a, a constant to phi and you subtract it to psi, you don't change anything in, in, in the, this uh, dual problem and in the Schrodinger uh, system. I will call the Schrodinger system this set of two equations phi equals minus epsilon log, blah, 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 and psi equals minus epsilon log, blah, blah, blah. And uh, in terms of A and B, it means that there is a sort of um, uh, multiplicative invariant. If you multiply A by uh, a positive constant and you divide B by the same constant, you still get the, the system is invariant by this. So it means some normalization has to be made if you want to have uniqueness results, for instance, okay? So of course, uh, Gabriel described the synchron algorithm. Uh, once you see these two equations, it's very tempting to iterate over the, the set of two equations to express A as a function of B and B as a function of A. And this is basically what the, the, the synchron algorithm does, which is it's quite, a, quite simple. It's two line of uh, iterating. You look for a fixed point of the map if you want, and you do uh, iterations of this, uh, this map. And uh, as Gabriel uh, mentioned, there is a very nice uh, approach to, to, to proof convergence, which is based on the so-called uh, Hilbert projective metric. It's, projective means somehow uh, that you, you, you keep track of the invariance by multiplying A by a constant and, and, and dividing B by the same constant. 
which is based on the um, on a theorem of Birkhoff, which shows basically linear convergence of uh, visitor rates to uh, to a solution of the, the Schrodinger system. Okay. Uh, I mentioned that this proof does not work, as far as I know, uh, in the multi-marginal case, because if you look at the Lipschitz constant for the Hilbert metric, there's a number of marginals minus one we chose up in the Lipschitz constant. So uh, you cannot see it's a contraction as far as there are more than uh, three marginals or more. Okay. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned by Gabriel as well uh, in, in, in the previous talk, uh, you can see also synchron in terms of the potential psi and phi to do this sort of, of cold transform. Instead of looking at A and B, you look at phi and psi. It's the same as um, block minimization or alternate uh, maximization for the dual problem. So given psi, given phi, when you look for the best psi in the, in the dual problem, you exactly uh, have this formula, right? So synchron is the same as alternate uh, maximization for the dual. So of course, as a, uh, let me mention a little bit uh, of uh, literature. It's, uh, it's related to lots, uh, lots and lots of uh, works in different communities, in different settings, something uh, different communities call uh, the same objects uh, under different names. And uh, of course, the, this audience is super familiar with uh, the Schrodinger uh, system, Schrodinger bridges and related problems. Uh, first of all, the system appeared in the, in the seminal work of Schrodinger in the 30s. Uh, very early on, it raised interest uh, of uh, great mathematicians or such as uh, Bernstein in the 30s, and later on, uh, Arno Berling in the 60s. Of course, I, I will stick to the static formulation, but there's uh, a, a dynamic formulation for the quadratic cost, for instance, uh, which is a flavor of large deviations. Uh, I should mention a very nice paper by Dawson and Gartner, the, the lecture note by Hans Fulmer, the, the work of Le, uh, Christian Leonard, which was instrumental to, to uh, bring this problem to the optimal transport community. It's also very much related to stochastic control and the, the work of Professor Mikami uh, was very important in this, uh, in this respect. Uh, the problem of Schrodinger bridges has been extended in many direction and many of uh, uh, people in Lisbon and, and, and their collaborators have been uh, involved in, in uh, very interesting developments in the, Unbalanced case, for instance, let me mention the work of, uh, of uh, Barada, of uh, Lavenant, uh, general metric spaces, uh, the work of, uh, of um, Leonard Monsaint-Jean, uh, Tamanini, Vorotnikov, uh, and others, the work of uh, Conforti, Gentil. Uh, so it's a very uh, active field uh, of research. Uh, related also to problem which has a flavor of uh, incompressible fluid dynamics, the so-called Brödinger problem, uh, which uh, uh, Mark, uh, Arnaudon, Cruzero, Leonard Zambrini, uh, building upon uh, previous work of Uyazue, or Barada and Mont-Saint-Jean uh, worked on. It's also related, some mean field games can, can also been, uh, be uh, cast in these frameworks, something we, we used a few years ago uh, at Mocha Plan with uh, Jean-David, Simone Di Marino, and uh, Luca Nena. Uh, solving the Schrodinger problem, the discrete case uh, is linked to the so-called DAD problem, which in the continuous case has been very much studied uh, by John Borwein, Adrian Lewis, um, Roger Nussbaum in the 90s. Uh, the algorithm comes also under different names uh, in statistics, uh, IPFP, the iterated proportional figure, uh, iterish, Iterated proportional fitting procedure uh, with works of uh, Cesar, Ruschendorf, and, and others. And of course, in the last decade, it's been, it's been very much used for approximating numerically optimal transport, as was uh, pushed forward in the seminal paper by Couturi, as also um, an important paper by Galichon and Salanier, Couturi and Perez's book, and, uh, and um, Alfred Galichon's book with, uh, on application of optimal transport to, to economics played a great role to, to, to make these methods popular. So now, okay, this is basically, uh, sorry for it's a very long introduction, and uh, I guess most of you are familiar with that. Uh, now let me go to multi-marginals. So multi-marginals, uh, now you don't have only two marginals to fit so as to make uh, 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 an average cost minimal. 
you got several spaces, x1 up to xn, a cost which depends on the position of all the particles. You got marginals mu1 up to mu n on the different spaces, and you want a, an optimal plan, but a multi plan, gamma, which has marginals mu1 up to mu n, which makes this uh, overall guy minimal. Okay. So I will not describe uh, applications uh, in details, but it comes in different settings. Uh, in physics, in particular, uh, for instance, uh, in, in uh, studying uh, incompressible um, uh, fluid dynamics in the, in, in, in the spirit of the seminal work of uh, Brenier, for instance. Uh, also, um, in, in so-called density functional theory in, in quantum chemistry, uh, the cost is a Coulomb cost, it's a repulsive cost between the position of n electrons, and you end up with similar uh, problems. Uh, there are problems in economics and in machine learning also, where you are also interested in, in multi-marginals. Okay. So we can mimic to the multi-marginal uh, case what we saw in the two-marginal case. Let me mention also that there are much less uh, results general results available in the literature in the multi-marginal case. Uh, for instance, uh, we, uh, there are no general results which say that the optimizers should be of most types or things like this. They are very scarce in the literature with a few exceptions like the work of uh, Brendan Pass. So it's very tempting, at least numerically, for instance, to approximate the problem by entropic approximation. So we can guess that the good approximation of the previous uh, multi-marginal OT is to, uh, you look at the product measure, you multiply by the Gibbs kernel, and you try to make the relative entropy between the transport plan and this guy as small as possible. You minimize this, okay? So again, formally, uh, you can guess that the optimal plan should have a special structure. It should be the Gibbs kernel times the product times the product measure. And now the constraint is that this guy has marginals mu i, for which if you write the, um, yeah, it's the gamma epsilon in exponential form as I did here, you just have to solve, to look for potential phi i, which solve is system seven, which I will call the multi-marginal multi -marginal, uh, Schrodinger system. So you look for potential phi i, such that the marginal of this gamma epsilon, you take this and that, this, you take this and that, and they have the good margin. So this is system seven, okay? And the rest of my talk will be devoted to study this system, okay? So again, you can forget from now on, uh, there is a big warning here. Of course, there are lots of things and many of you, uh, or many of your co-authors have been involved in the very important issue of what happens if uh, epsilon, by the way, can you all hear me? Because I don't see the chat, so, Leonard? We can hear you. No, now you, you can all hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Cool. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, okay. So I said there is a, a huge uh, stream of research. It's still very active now on understanding uh, precisely what happens it's a, as epsilon goes to zero, in which sense you approximate the optimal transport problem. Uh, similar contribution by uh, Christian uh, and uh, more recently by uh, Giovanni, uh, Sumik Pal, Marcel Nutz, Luca Tamani, and many others. But for the rest of the talk, I have the two things. I, I will not be interested in letting epsilon go to zero. I will stick to the system. So I will take epsilon to be one, okay? So uh, for those of you uh, who are not interested in the fixed epsilon case, you can just uh, take a nap or go for a coffee or, or early lunch. Uh, and also I'll stick on the algebra, on the system. I will mainly forget that it comes from optimization. Okay, so the first question is, uh, is, is this system well posed? So, for, so you give yourself new eyes, you give yourself a cost C and you want to solve this system. Is there existence, uniqueness? Does the solution depend smoothly on the data? And this is what I want to, to discuss now. It's something we, we did a few years ago with Maxim in a quite general uh, framework. So uh, for the spaces, I will assume just uh, probability spaces, Xi, Fi, Mi. 
So X will be the product, uh, M will be the product measure, and F uh, will be the product uh, sigma algebra. Uh, also, let me introduce, so the, the MIs will be reference measures, and we'll look at marginals mu i, which are, uh, which are density with respect to these uh, reference measures. And uh, to his notation, it will be convenient to use, uh, uh, to use the notation minus i to denote all variables except i. Okay, so now we'll write m minus y, a, m minus i, which will be the product measure of the, all the mj with j different from i, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the problem is the following, and uh, okay, I will work in the in an L infinity framework. So note that I will not assume any sort of continuity or I will not even assume that the xi are Polish spaces, but I will assume that the cost C is L infinity for the, on the product space. Okay, this would be mainly my, uh, it's a limitation, but it's quite an abstract assumption. Okay. So I will denote by L infinity uh, of X, uh, of the individual space XI and of the, of the product spect X. And when I put a plus plus, it will be the interior of the non-negative cone, okay? The, the function which are bounded and uh, essentially bounded away from zero, uh, M or less M almost everywhere. So I give myself the kernel K, which is exponential minus C. So it, it is in the interior of the, the positive cone of uh, L infinity. I give myself also strictly positive densities with an obvious compatibility condition that uh, the integral of mu i dmi should not depend on, on i, otherwise I have no, no chance to find a, a plan which has the mu i m i as marginals. And uh, I'm looking for potentials phi i, which are also bounded, such that for every i and m i or almost every x i, I had this equation. So mu i of x i is the exponential of phi i x i times this integral. Okay, this is the same system as we had before in this, uh, in this business. So this is the, the multi-marginal uh, Schrodinger system, right? So of course, as I said, for the two marginal case, there's an obvious uh, compatibility condition on the mu i, let's say the data, the marginal mu i, which is this equation nine. And there's also an invariance of the Schrodinger system itself uh, the system 10 I, I want to solve, meaning this, if I add a constant lambda i to the phi i and the lambda i sum to zero, I change nothing to the problem. So there's an obvious invariance. So I can add a normalization to the phi i, okay, which is what I'm doing in this slide. There is no loss of generality in adding normalization constraints, which are the n minus one linear equation that the mean of the phi i should be zero for the n minus one first margins. Okay, this changes nothing, but imposing these constraints, uh, at least uh, I have a chance to have a unique solution. Okay. Again, I can notice that uh, the Schrodinger uh, system is a system of optimality condition for concave maximization problem, which consists in maximizing a little of the term, which is the first guy minus this exponential term, so this is problem, um, problem uh, 12, and uh, it is strictly concave in the sum, the direct sum of the phi i. So if I impose as a normalization, there can be only one minimizer, one maximizer, okay? So existence, I will discuss later, but uniqueness, uh, as soon as I normalize, it can be taken for granted, okay? So uh, I will work in basically in L infinity for the potential. I will look for bounded potentials which satisfy the normalization condition. So this is a space, Banner space, which I denote by E. And for a phi, a collection of potential phi one to phi n, uh, with, where each phi i is, is uh, in L infinity, I will define a map, a nonlinear map T. So T of phi, is a collection T1 of phi, Tn of phi, where Ti of phi is in the corresponding L infinity space, which is just the average of this exponential. So Ti of phi at the point xi is given by the average respect to all the other variables, it's a sort of convolution if you want, of the kernel 
multiply by the exponential of the other potentials, of the sum of the other potentials. Okay, so this is a smooth map. In fact, it's, it's, it's a C infinity, it's even a real analytic. And the goal given mu i's, I want to solve t of phi equals mu. Okay, so the range of t is obviously including in the, in the interior of the positive cone and uh, in a subspace f, which is characterized by this compatibility condition we saw before that the, um, so f is a set of collection mu one to mu n, which solves the compatibility condition that the integral of mu i and dmi should not depend on i, okay? So with this definition, the Schrodinger system is just to solve the equation mu equals t of phi. Mu is given in this banner space f. In fact, in the positive, uh, in the interior of the positive cone of this space. And I look for, my, for potential phi in this space e. So here is the well poisonous uh, results. So which says that for every mu in this f plus plus, there is a unique solution, but the reverse map with the solution which I denote S of mu, S for Schrodinger, but this map is C infinity, okay? So let me give the, 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 the proof is very simple. It's basically based on, uh, on um, the implicit uh, function on in the local inverse, uh, inverse function theorem plus some uh, structural properties and, and which I'm and a computation I'm gonna show you. Uh, and the Fredholm uh, alternative theorem uh, to, to be to be a bit cautious because we are in uh, in infinite dimensions. It's a computation I want to show you. So, okay. So let's start with local integral invertibility. So I have to invert somehow uh, the derivative of this nonlinear map uh, T. Um, so it's convenient to take the log, the component-wise logarithm of this map, which I know it's T tilde, so T tilde, uh, so it's a, a nonlinear map, and it is a very nice structure, a sort of diagonal part. So you see that T tilde i is just phi i plus an off diagonal part, which is this logarithm here in equation 16. And I can differentiate, and when I differentiate uh, the i's component, the T tilde i, I, uh, in the direction of some potential h, h1 up to h n, I, I see that it is identity, this derivative has a nice structure. This is identity plus an integral. So it's a, a compact perturbation of identity, okay? So when I differentiate this t tilde uh, in the direction, I discover uh, this h i of x i plus this formula. But this formula is an integral. And uh, being an integral, it has some nice, compactness property, let's say in L2, okay? And since, uh, so I want to prove that the, the, the derivative of t, t prime of phi is invertible in some sense. So I will look for uh, uh, an h in the null space. And I observe that, of course, uh, passing from t prime to t tilde prime is just multiplying by uh, non-vanishing uh, and bounded potential. So the null space of t tilde is the same as the null space of t. So I will work with t tilde and its derivative. So of course, uh, this, this expression uh, for the derivative can be extended for an h which is not in L infinity, but simply in L2. If I do so, I observe that the, the derivative is, uh, is a compact perturbation of the identity. So it's a good framework to apply the Fredholm uh, theory. And uh, to identify the null space, I can, it's also convenient to, uh, to introduce this probability measure on the product space, this Q phi. So like now I'm in the step of proving local invertibility. So phi is fixed. Uh, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna work in the neighborhood of phi. So here is this, this measure. It's a, a measure which is equivalent to the product measure M. And then I can, it's convenient also to, for each i, it's convenient to disintegrate the, the, the measure q phi with respect to its i's marginal. So I denote by q phi, q phi i, the i's marginals, and q phi minus one given x i is the corresponding conditional marginal. 
And now the off diagonal part of the derivative of, uh, of T, uh, remember that I, I wrote it, it in, in a convenient way as identity plus L, the, the off diagonal part, the L part, can be written as a sort of uh, conditional expectation operator using this measure Q phi. So Li of H, Li of H at the point Xi is just the conditional expectation of the sum of the other potentials, the direct sum of the other potential with respect to the conditional probability Q phi minus Y given Xi. Okay, so it's a conditional expectation operator, which is applied to the sum of the other potential, all the potential except I. So now let's take uh, a direction in the null space. It means that HI is the negative of this conditional uh, uh, expectation with respect uh, to this uh, measure, this conditional measure Q phi minus I. And now it's very, it's very, uh, it's just an, uh, an algebraic trick. Remember that I want to prove that uh, uh, I want to identify the, the, the null space of the derivative. So if I start from this relation, I take H in the null space, I multiply this guy by HI of XI itself, and I integrate with respect to the ice module. So if I do that, I, I, discovered, I discovered that the integral of the square of HI square, the integral of the square of HI with respect to Q phi I is a negative of this sum of um, this sort of uh, correlations. And now if I sum with respect to all the, the, the components I, there's a perfect square which shows up. So I discovered that the, the integral of the sum, the direct sum of the I chi uh, should be zero. In fact, it's H in the, is in the null space of uh, T prime of phi, then it means that Q phi almost everywhere, the sum is zero. The direct sum is zero. Okay, it's just uh, algebra if you want. But now it means that the null space, let's say in L2 of the differential, consists exactly of constants which sum to zero. So it has dimension n minus one. But now if I normalize, remember that I was working in a space where I imposed some normalization that the integral of the i chi dmi was zero for the n minus one values of i. So the null space of t prime in this space is exactly zero, okay? So the null space is dimension n minus one, but now because of the Fredholm theory uh, the co-dimension of the range is also n minus one, but this is precisely the space, the dimension of the space F of compatible uh, densities mu i, right? This is, okay. So what, what have I proven? I've proven that in L2, I have some, some uh, isomorphism, uh, the derivative is some isomorphism between E and F basically, but instead of working in L infinity, I work in L2. So, uh, but in, in fact, all these operators and, and, and the inverse as well, if I have uh, L infinity data, I send L infinity to L infinity. So this argument proves local invertibility, but I know also that globally, the nonlinear map T is one-to-one. -one. This is because the dual problem is strictly convex, is strictly concave. So there is uniqueness. And now there's also a topological trick that the range of the map, because of the local invertibility, I know that in F++ it is open, but you can also show quite easily that it is closed and F++ is convex. So the map is also, the nonlinear map is also onto, okay? So in fact, I can pass from local inverse function theorem to sort of global version, which is quite classical, right? It is uh, also uh, ideas which go back from Adama, I guess, and you can prove that the inverse is in fact a C infinity map. Okay, that's how it works. So it's it's a few lines of computation. It's just the, the you see that it's nothing to do with uh, the calculus of variations or whatever. It's just 
computing the derivative and computing a null space of a, a certain nonlinear map. Um, okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Probably 10 minutes or five minutes. Uh, okay. Now let me mention. Uh, sorry. No, no, 10 minutes is fine. Perfect. 10 minutes is fine. Okay, I won't have time to, to, to go in the details, but now I will, I will uh, like to go, okay, we're happy to know we can solve the, the system and uh, that the solution depends smoothly on the, on the daytime UI. By the same argument, it also depends smoothly on the, on the kernel. It depends smoothly if you, yeah, you add uh, uh, an epsilon uh, far from zero, far from infinity, it's also the, the dependence is also smooth with respect to epsilon. This is just an implicit function theorem. But in practice, how do we solve the system? So it has been explained by, uh, by Gabriel. We, we solve the system by uh, a la Gauss-Seidel or by uh, alternate maximization. We solve one equation at a time. This is a synchron algorithm. So again, again, same business. I want to solve the same system of equation. I, I solve them one by one. And the multi-marginal um, uh, synchron algorithm uh, it goes like this. Um, by the way, it's, it's the same as solving the Euler-Lagrange equation of a certain dual problem. Here, I, I've changed the sign. So this function f of phi is convex. I multiplied the previous guy by minus one. So it's a, a convex function. Okay, there's a linear guy and the integral of two phi, which depends in an exponential way on the direct sum of the phi i. And okay, I want to find a critical point of this problem 22. Uh, of course, I impose normalization because otherwise uh, I cannot guarantee uniqueness. So same normalization as before. I uh, normalize the n minus one averages of the, the first potential of the n minus one first potential to be zero. Uh, so this is what my notation diamond means uh, zero mean if you want. LP space with a diamond uh, as an index will, be, will mean zero min. And I'm considering the problem of minimizing this f of phi on the space on L infinity, but I impose the normalization on the n minus one potential. So now it's synchron. So it's a block minimization. So given phi t at the t step, uh, I look at phi, I, phi one t plus one by minimizing the function f with respect to the first marginal where you have frozen the next components. So it is totally explicit. Okay, I don't want to get too much into this. There's a minus, there's a sort of log Laplace and there's a normalization constraint, it's lambda one T. And once I have the updated phi one, I do the same for phi two, phi, phi, phi three and so on. And uh, I update the last one. There's no normalization because the last one is not unnormalized and gives this formula. I don't care too much about the formulas but you see, this is exactly what Gabriel described. This is synchron in the multi-marginal setting. And my only assumption again is that C is in L infinity, so that K is in L infinity plus plus, the interior of the positive cone. The convergence of synchron without traits uh, using really heavily the fact that uh, this is uh, this is uh, Gauss-Seidel, if you want, was observed uh, in a very nice paper by uh, Simone Di Marino and Augusto Girolin, uh, but it, it came without weight. Again, as far as I know, uh, and this is why I was interested in this, the, the um, Hilbert metric proof and other proofs you can think of that do not work in the, in the multi-marginal uh, multi, uh, problem. That's why I was interested in this. And here is the result. It's a linear convergence result. Of course, it's the constraint, the constant is extremely bad. It's exponential, is in uh, in the number of marginals, in the L infinity norm of the cost. If you put the epsilon, that's one over epsilon, the exponential as well, as in uh, the results uh, Gabriel mentioned, but still, uh, you got linear convergence, at least for the convergence of the energy in the dual problem. So you look at the energy along the synchron sequence, uh, it decays exponentially fast with, uh, with an explicit constant. And it is also true for the iterates. The iterates converge to the unique uh, minimizer of the dual problem, which is normalized uh, in any LP. 
you, you can pass from, uh, you can also uh, do it in L-infinity, but it requires other, uh, other assumption on the cost. Okay, so how does it work? Just two, 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 two words on the, on the proof. Uh, the proof works like this. It's very standard, in fact, in, in optimization, at least in finite dimension, in uh, convex programming. Um, it's known that you have linear convergence of uh, block descent, provided, let's say, in, in a Hilbert space or in, 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 or in finite dimension, you need two things. You need the energy to have a Lipschitz gradient and to have uh, a Hessian, which is bounded from below. Which of course you don't have in the dual because you've got an exponential, so it's not true. But in fact, the the synchron iterates by construction they are bounded, right? Because let me show you the iterates again. Uh, let me show you the first one. So look at this equation twenty six. So you see that this phi one has mean zero, and it's not difficult to see that whatever the other potential are. The L infinity norm, well, the oscillation of this guy is controlled by the oscillation of the cost. So K is exponential minus C, and the oscillation of uh, K controls the oscillation of this sort of uh, soft C transforms. So if you have zero mean and uh, your oscillation is controlled by uh, two times the L infinity norm of C, you are yourself bounded. So in fact, the phi T, the phi T's are automatically bounded something which was observed already uh, by, you know, by many people, including uh, Augusto and, uh, and Simone. So for free, you can notice that the phi, the phi t's, the synchron iterates remain uniformly bounded, right? With bounds, which are linear with respect to the, 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 the bounds you have in the beginning in C. But now, what do you do? You're basically minimizing something linear plus an exponential, but uh, okay, the exponential is bad, on the whole space, but it's very good on, uh, on intervals, right? And uh, so, for instance, the detachment from its, uh, its order, its first order uh, Taylor approximation is quadratic. So, if you're on an in interval minus mm, it is true that the eigenvalues of the Asian are bounded away from zero. And it is also true that uh, the derivative is an exponential itself. It is true that the exponential is Lipschitz on there every interval. Okay. So, now from this, for a suitable constant, you see that the, the, the gain, or the loss in energy on one step, full step of synchron from step t to step t plus one is controlled, is bounded from below by the squared L2 norm between the iterates themselves. Okay, this is strong convexity. Okay, so in particular, you see that the, the right hand side in three eight is uh, is uh, the term of a convergence uh, series series in in, in L two. So in particular, phi t minus phi t plus one converges strongly in L two, and in fact in any LP. So from this, you can guess quite easily that there is strong convergence in an ALP to a phi bar which solves the, the Schrodinger system. You've got lots of compactness in uh, in the Schrodinger system. And, uh, and from basically this, uh, this super simple uh, estimate 36, you can derive quite directly the linear convergence of uh, the synchron iterates. Okay. Uh, and maybe it's a good time to stop and to, if you have questions, I'd, I'd be super happy to, to answer, right? Thank you very much, Guillaume. Very nice talk. Uh, has anyone questions? So if you're following online, you can just unmute yourself as usual or someone in the audience perhaps. Yeah, Gabriel, just a second. Uh, yes, just to clarify. So um, in the case of two marginals, your estimate are roughly matching those that you get with uh, Hilbert divergence? Absolutely. So it's like exponential minus uh, the infinite norm of the cost divided by epsilon. Absolutely. And it's more or less just a factor n that you have uh, to Absolutely. pay when yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, super nice. Thanks a lot. And uh, maybe it's obvious, but I guess. Uh, so I guess, uh, yeah. maybe I should recall. Sorry, Gabriel, to interrupt you. 
there are pros and cons in this result. Of course, uh, it's crucial that the cost is bounded, which excludes interesting applications. So there's the Gaussian kernel or the, the Coulomb cost uh, and so on. But on the other end, I'm in a quite abstract setting. The two results are in an abstract setting, right? These are abstract probability spaces. And uh, what I require is that uh, the, the, the cost is an in, in L infinity. So there's, there's no topological assumption if you want. It's just working in, L, in LP spaces. Okay, and, and uh, would this extend to things where uh, the iterate would be less explicit that if you, for instance, regularize with something else than the entropy, or I mean, instead of the Shannon entropy, you were, would be using another entropy function, oh. for instance, or if we uh, don't consider uh, exact constraint on the marginal, but like uh, unbalanced constraint or more exotic uh, uh, things that people would do in application. Uh, well, it's a good question. I didn't think too much in detail, but I, I, probably on a case by case basis, it's probably to extend. Uh, it's probably probably uh, possible to extend the results I, I showed to this uh, to to this setting. I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you have if you have some application in mind, I'd be happy, of course, to discuss with you. Right? Oh, but I, I would say just simply, uh, what would be the hypothesis you need to put on the entropy function so that your uh, reasoning would work because it seems much more flexible than uh, than the Hilbert matrix. So uh, I guess this would be oh, nice. Okay. Oh, well, you like, like, you know, like uh, you, you okay. do Dijkstra algorithm, but with something else than Kullback. Uh, well, you, you, you need basically locally uh, a strong convexity and Lipschitzianity of the gradient to the level of the dual function. You see, yeah. but locally. So other divergences are possible than kullback Uh I guess it describes a, a world class. It, would, it wouldn't work for a power, for instance. Yeah, so I guess it would not work for x square, right? Or would it? No, maybe it would. Uh, but x square is special, right? But uh, for x square, for because it's exactly quadratic. But uh, well, what is popular in application is people they don't necessarily use uh, Shannon entropy, but they could use uh, x square entropy because it mm -hmm. produces a uh, sparse. Uh, ah. Less is it's a bit like uh, having bonded uh, mm -hmm. bonded diffusion support. So I think something that would be interesting. Uh, in application. Mm. Okay, th thanks, Guillaume. Uh, no? ah. Hello, Guillaume, it's Christian. Well, uh, uh, well uh, the cost is, is bonded and you say it's crucial, but in, in some applications, if you make the hypothesis that the marginal are compactly supported, um, uh, is it is it enough with uh, to to get the result and to to go back to the in some sense since your cost is continuous and everything yeah. is interesting on a compact set? Yeah, yeah sure, 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 sure. Of course, uh, works. Okay, so so if you have a quadratic cost and compact compactly supported marginal, it's all right. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, uh, but you see, I never say the word compact anywhere talking about the space. I, I didn't make, um, I didn't say uh, anything about the topology of the space Xi. Yes, yes. So a point I wanted to make. So um, what I need is bad. So probably, I, I don't know, that's a, now I have a question for you, right? Because uh, I would have loved to be in Lisbon in front of you. Uh, <laughs> I'd be interested also in application in infinite dimension in the case where the X size, the X size are in, in infinite dimensions. Because, uh, there might be cases where the cost is just bounded, but uh, you make no assumption of continuity or nothing, right? Of course, if you have continuity, you see that you can use uh, uh, Ascola, uh, As Ascoli, Ascoli, uh, <laughs> Ascoli, Arzola. No, I, Ascola, uh, Arzeli uh, theorem. Synchronity uh, race remains in a, in a set of uniformly con uh, continuous functions okay, and so on yeah. and so forth, which I'm not, never using here. I'm just working in LP spaces. So, so yeah, to answer your question, yes, you, you can replace, uh, you can replace boundedness by, in your case, you are bounded because you, in fact, you can work on the support if they are compact, mm -hmm. it's fine. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Christian.
So since Max is away just for a few seconds, I actually have a question of my own, very much in the spirit of uh, Christian's one is, so about your densities, your marginal densities, you assume that there's like strictly positive, so in the positive interior cone, so namely bounded, whose density is bounded away from below. Can you remove that? Because vacuum is important to allow for, right? Okay, so this is for the well positiveness, okay? Where the MIs are whatever you want, but of course, if you want to have uh, an analytic dependence with respect to the data. Yeah, that's the, that's the smooth dependence, right? But okay. as far as existence and uniqueness is concerned, this should not be... Agreed, dependent, but then right? it's not smooth. So just the result is false if you right. allow the new eyes to, 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 to cancel or... Uh -huh. uh, it's really essential that all these measures, it's, it's, it's transparent in the proof. At some point I said that this measure Q5, it's a sort of change of measure, uh, is equivalent to um, right. So it's really the smoothness of the solution map, right? Not not existing. Okay. All right. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? Maybe in the chat. I don't see any questions. Okay. So let's take a few minutes just to change slides, and let's thank Guillaume again. Thank you. Thank you.